Yes. Are you on the staff here? I used to be on the staff. Oh, yeah. About five years ago. I really appreciate you all uh, letting me uh, speak to you today. I think it's great that as many people are here are interested in radio astronomy. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So I uh, want to talk about a work that I've done in collaboration with um, Green Bank, and because actually they sort of give me the uh, enthusiasm to keep going on. Actually, I think they're a great support group for these projects, obviously. Um, so, but I work at the National Science Foundation, um, and this was this is the telescope that they, the Suan. I think you probably have seen this. I don't know. Has anybody seen this before? This picture of the, the a few of Skip has, has, and a few of that. Um, and uh, so we, they, they basically had students come and build radio telescopes just basically by showing them one. They didn't give them any plans really whatsoever, except for this is a radio telescope. <laughs> and uh, that's why I've got one out in the, in the hall here. And if I can find an HDMI cable, we'll actually run it. Um, but uh, and, uh, anyway, but, but so, so it's very doable to build this. This one, um, you run basically with a laptop. And I, the key thing, of course, is a good amplifier, first stage blue noise amplifier. But those are made up available virtually. Um, and so let me tell you what, so this is what we're trying to get to, is we're trying to get, what would, what would be a home run for the NSF? Who cares about, Sarah, what's, what's the NSF want? The NSF wants to stand up a, a national science project that is actually valuable, right? So we're looking, I think that where Sarah probably will fit in the best is in the education outreach part of a big proposal that would be probably run by universities. The NSF primarily works with universities, and we never, almost never make a, a grant to an individual person. We always make the National Science Foundation makes grants to universities or, or organizations like the Associated <coughs> Universities Incorporated, is a nonprofit organization, probably not legally different than SARA is. It's sort of a matter of, you know, if they have the same, they can run big thing. Um, so, anyway, so I'm a permanent astronomer at the National Science Foundation. I was here for 20 years. Um, I was working with, so, uh, with uh, Sue Ann Heatherly, of course, it's really my spiritual leader, and then Sophie Knudsen, Evan Smith, and Eve Knopf, and also, uh, also someone inspired by Ellie, too. So she did, she's, uh, been, uh, she's been sort of organizing us. It's really funny to empower us to do that. Um, so what I, the goals of this presentation are to show that a Basically, the Horn telescope that we have, you can see the, the galaxy in neutral hydrogen in like two or three seconds. So it's very, very sensitive for, for the whole surf of the <coughs> sky now. It's, there's no issue with sensitivity anymore. It's all practical. How do you build one of these things? Um, and uh, students use it. We, we want the students probably first off to see them under teacher supervision, right? So we sort of have a, a plan that we would be, uh, every high school would have a radio telescope and they would build their own, right? That was what we would like. Because we would like to stand these up as a national facility, all done by volunteers, right? So that would be, that would be a home run for the National Science Foundation to do that. Um, so what we, but the NSF itself does not do research. That's actually specifically in the NSF rules, in fact, how it was funded, because they didn't want another federal agency dominating the research. They actually wanted groups and outside. So you have to understand the NSF model in order to understand what the NSF does is we review proposals by different organizations, universities primarily, and looking at those proposals, then we select the ones that we think, well actually usually, not even we, but we usually find uh, like other professors and they who are happen to not be submitting because they won an award last year usually. And so then they review the proposals and they pick the rank and then we fund them down until our money runs out. Um, but so what we're, so I'm actually, I have a, I've coined the time, uh, the phrase science aficionados. And that's what I would like to see. It sort of has some political correctness or Spanish thing. Um, um, but anyway, but so uh, who am I, first of all? So, what, so I've been an optical, uh, and radio astronomer for quite a few years. I actually, uh, you know, Don, I was Barack Obama's galactic astronomy person, astronomer for a while. Now I'm Donald Trump's galactic. Astronomer. Peter probably doesn't know that he has a galactic astronomy, <laughs> 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 but he does. Um, but anyway, so I'm responsible for the grant, galactic astronomy grants program. So 
So if you if you are looking for a, a grant in uh, galactic astronomy, you would put in a proposal to the National Science Foundation, and then we would review that with all of the other hundreds of proposals we have. Um, I have the lead a lead role in outreach and citizen science at the NSF, and um, I enjoy software development. So I'm more so uh, unfortunately. I, I can't resist uh, trying to build things, and I have terrible times with it every time. I'm just like a, I have, a, but anyway, but I do, I surface mount soldered something just two days ago, and I was proud that it sort of seemed to work. Um, but the software that I, everybody now in the modern software world uses this thing called GitHub. Who used GitHub? Have you, anybody, have, oh, everybody, okay, and you're all like, you know, you're like experts. Huh? So that's how you get your software. So if you want to get my little software-defined radio, and you you have already got your new radio downlink, then downloaded and installed. This this lives on top of that. Uh, you will uh, be able to run the telescoping. I'm sorry to say the contrast on your uh, email is very bad up there. Oh oh yeah you're right. So Jalanko at nsf.gov. I think this pro this slide will be on the web somewhere. You can Excuse me. The Jalanko is the same as your gets. Yes, Jalang, so yeah. All right, about that. So first, a little bit about the NSF. So the NSF operates, uh, funds the operation. We do not operate the national, the NRAO or the GBO or Arecibo, but the NSF, your government spends about $100 million a year operating radio telescopes throughout the world. So it's a fairly big thing. The NSF astronomy budget is one approximately a quarter of a billion dollars a year. That's what the NSF, the National Science Foundation, spent. Um, so we're proud of all of the facilities we have, and we, unfortunately, we're actually have had, I would say that the, the main issue happens to be that we've actually been successful in building more telescopes than we can easily afford to operate. So that's sort of the balancing problem. Uh, the, the NSF is a big part of the federal budget, but not the, by far not the hugest part. So the Department of Defense is, gets half of the research budget, or approximately half. NASA gets uh, 8, well, 9 percent, and the NSF is about 4 percent in 2000. So we're kind of a smaller player in the research and this is Health and Human Services and Department of Energy, and we do collaborations with NASA and DOE for certain kinds of fundamental physics experiments. Um, we actually have a CubeSat program too, I don't know if you've read that, but uh, I, I was involved, I'm not involved in that now, so I'd have to find who would be able to tell you anything. Um, uh, I have the same problem I guess with the contract, you can't see. So, I'm now I'm going to tell you... What, what, <laughs> that was bigger, so I can uh, see that. Uh, okay, good. Now I'm going to tell you um, approximately what we've been up to. Uh, and this is again... It's not what the NSF does, it's almost just what I'm doing as a project to get ready for somebody else to take over this project. Right? I'm, I am not going to do this national-wide, but I'm going to keep tinkering in my barn and my garage and all those places and build stuff. But, um, so this is Evan and Sophie. So it's key, we really, obviously you have an issue that we're a little bit on the older side here, except for uh, a few of us. Um, and the, how are you going to get younger people in? So what you're going to, in my opinion, what you're going to do is you're probably going to want to find high school teachers. How many of you are or were high school teachers? Is any, any of you were? So that's, I think that that's the in-group for you, right? To, to be a friend of a high school science thing would be a perfect way to be a part of yeah, our college. We, we've supported high school in our public outreach and we actually had uh, the teaching radio astronomy, but you really have to find the right person. Yes, high absolutely. school teachers tend to be a little lazy uh -huh. and come in with a new thing that offers more work to them. They're like, okay. yeah. oh. so, so you've got to really lose them somehow or find the right person. You know, I, I, I completely understand. I, I agree with that. And uh, there, was, there was actually a fun a, a guy, Kevin Bandura, at West Virginia University, and he did, he had to sort of solicit like a program for science teachers. And he had them, he actually did quite a complicated thing. He basically taught them uh, digital signal processing, introduction to astronomy, but he only got, I think there was 12 teachers in the whole East Coast or something like that. So you might have cast a very big net to get those, that group that you want. 
right? I mean, so you just cast for, go for everybody, and then you'll find a few that really will just love to do these projects. But they're going to be a select few, but that's okay, because you just want that to start off with. I wouldn't try to get, because they don't want to, I wouldn't try to, you know, get the wrong, you know, somebody just off well, your next door. called a fewer chosen. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> But so you can, so this is evidence, <laughs> like I said, and this is the, we've been through a lot of different uh, decisions about what kind of thing to build, right? And uh, we have sort of, we're, we're trying to be a low cost, you can build it yourself choice, but it's still not super low cost, unfortunately. It's sort of, you have to add up all the bits and pieces. We're sort of at the $500 point, right? For a whole rated telescope, um, all put together and operating. Um, by the time we put everything in, you know, it turns out the good amplifiers are like $100 for like the really great amplifiers and stuff like that. Um, and then you add in uh, computers and stuff like that. But, um, and so even there, they're using, this is my laptop they're using. Um, okay, let's, let's talk about the actual details, right? So now, I, I actually, we sort of had it, we went back and forth about how to put our designs on the web, right? And I said we should go with Sarah, so I kind of thought, well, Sarah would be a good organization for this. Um, but I think that didn't happen. They didn't want to do that. They wanted to have their own. That's a little bit of a trouble with each organization. They all want to have their own websites and stuff like that. So where all of the information is, including manuals and memos on how to build this telescope are on the uh, website, Open Source Radio Telescopes. And I would like to see at least Maybe there are already Sarah links to that. I don't know if there are or there aren't, but there should be. We actually have Sarah links to our website. Uh, there we go. Uh, actually, um, and so what? So here is what an example I like. To, so this is my son and his girlfriend, former girlfriend. I guess it's too much radio astronomy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so you know, you just need a horn, and you need. A, you need one thing that everybody, I think everybody knows, you need a resonant cavity. And then you need good amplifiers, and then this was a coaxial cable design and whatnot. Um, so what I've actually, what we've been doing, so I'm, afraid, I'm kind of embarrassed to show you this after uh, seeing the nice one that he made, but this one, we had to go with what you can buy at Trent's, right? It has to be purchasable in a hardware store. So this is a six inch circular uh, stove pipe, right? And uh, it's, you can't see it in there, but we had Steve White here at the, at the uh, NRIO, GBO, uh, tell us, it turns out you can really make a very sensitive receiver if you know where to put the feed probe, and you know what length the feed probe is. You can sort of just barely see it in there. Uh, don't bend it, you can pass it around. Um, it's, uh, you can bend, up. it's sort of, and we claim our best measurements, and we somewhat repeatable, were about 80 Kelvin with this I don't know if anybody knows about system temperature, but that's very sensitive for a commercial. Yeah. Right now, it's about 1.1 dB motion. Yeah, and so in there now is my new surface mount system because we, I take this to Alexandria. I can use this in Alexandria, Virginia, and I can see galactic hydrogen, wow. but they're dominated by outer band interference. So I just put in there a new more filters, and that sort of increased my system temperature quite a bit. So it's like 3 in Kelvin right now, so it's not really where I want to go. You know from Marcus? What? Did you get it from Marcus Leach? Uh, well, no, actually, yes, well, I, I talked to Marcus a lot, or I emailed Marcus. Uh, we're Facebook friends. And, uh, sort of, uh, and, but he's constantly giving me information. He's a very good guy to work with. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so this is the whole system. The key, though, is you can't just put that feed probe in there anywhere and get good. It really is fairly important that you put that exactly in the right spot. And right now, I think I've sort of crushed it, and I actually put copper tape in there. I'm giving you more details than I gave to try to get the, you know, the conductivity of the resident cavity up a little bit, just to sort of improve that. Um, but anyway, so I just wanted to try to uh, give you the idea of what we actually, and again, I'm here not to tell you how to build this, but really rather to get somebody else to do a better job at this. I think, I know that this group can do a better job at this, um, and, but anyway, I'll tell you what we've learned. But I think also to tell you how you have to, so we have the, so we have this memo series, again, this is my idea, I kind of like this sort of a light work is our memo system, because we're hoping that many hands make light work, right? So that's what our memos uh, title are, but you need to document what you're doing, right? So we, we are all the way up to 21 memos, 
Uh, some of them are not completely complete, but they're sort of partially. Um, again, it turns out bubble wrap is your go-to material for a radio telescope, in my opinion. It's really durable. It's, you know, you can leave it. That horn, this piece here has been outside uh, all winter, right? And you can, it will run, the software and everything will run for months. So it's really, and it doesn't, it may blow over, but then you <coughs> stand back up again. But, um, so anyway, so, but it's sort of, it's a pretty good material. If you want an all sky coverage, it turns out, so this thing with this horn has about a 15 degree beam. So it's not good at things like the sun. It's not really even very good at Andromeda, but it's really good at the galaxy. And um, if you wanted all sky coverage, you would just need 300, no, 180 some of these horns pointed in random different directions all the time, and you would have complete sky coverage all the time, and then you'd have to somehow figure out. I haven't got the software to put it all back in. But, um, so what is in, uh, is in my devices? It turns out you need a lot of gain to make this work. I think you, again, so I actually have a degree in engineering, but I'm mostly a software guy, but everybody, you probably know. So you have to have a really good semi-rigid cable going into a really good, I only really use evaluation boards. I don't do any custom, I just buy whatever the best evaluation board. So this was a good evaluation board. It goes in one side, out the other side, it has five volts. It has one filter here in this case. This, this thing is for, four, this is H1 thing, so it's 14 there. Everything is commercially purchasable. Unfortunately, by the time you buy all these things, you're looking at about 180 bucks, right? So that's sort of a, it's expensive, but that's just what, if you buy the, you know, this is 60 bucks. Um, some of the things here. Uh, you can actually get different bits and pieces uh, for different amounts, but that, you know, and this guy, Kevin Bandura, has also built one that is uh, a single board for about 60 or 70 bucks, but still by parts and everything, you have to, but we don't, he doesn't, he does it for his own thing, so he doesn't do it to build uh, for, uh, so it's not commercial, so you have to figure out how to get commercially done. Um, so, but I, again, so we, we actually, uh, you know, so this is Sophie again, and this is the student thing that was built last summer. I'm not quite sure what they're going to do. I think they're going to build more this year. Um, and this is the, they built two of them, and again, they were just done basically by showing them. And it turns out that, I'll tell you an interesting thing, that I thought that I was helping them. It turned out I was a specimen in their study. They actually wanted uh, students to learn how to work with scientists. So I was just part of the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was a so random scientist. In but, anyway, so, but then what happens is always somebody takes charge. Like Ellie's a take charge person. This girl was a big take charge. And once they built it, they had to then report, give, basically give a presentation on what they built and how it worked and people ask questions. So you need, that's where I think you guys would be very strong is in the receive side of this with sort of comments, right? <laughs> so you could go to, you know, the thing is you would like to have your high school build this thing, you know, it didn't work the first time, it turns out you have to fix it. And then after that, then you have to give, have them make presentations because when you're talking to high schools, what you want, what they want is leadership and Project management, they don't really care about radio astronomy. I'm sorry to say, they don't care about radio astronomy. It's a disappointing fact, but they don't. But it doesn't matter because you're still doing all of the skills, the life skill kind of things they need. is Running a project, knowing how to make a presentation, and, sort of, and all of those things you can sell as a part of what a high school person knows. That's why they do science fairs, is the presentation business. So that's sort of what, you're, what you can sell. Um, so, I just you know, keep puttering around there, and uh, so here's my radio telescopes. This is, so I told you that my first one, my wife refused to use, so I couldn't use that. <laughs> and um, so I had, to, I told somebody, I forget. But it, so it turns out it was best just to make a big protractor, because you have a 15 degree beam, and also, forget about motors, that was just trouble. You don't, you don't want to, like those H1 things that were done by... Drift scan. Drift scans, there's drift scans, and that's the way to go. Um, because... You know, you're gonna, then you've got a lot of money invested in this thing. You've got to worry about it. You know, if you just keep everything low price and simple, they, they, they're also trying to give them the basics of how it works. You're not trying to, you know, build, you're not going to compete with the GBT. You just don't have the area. You don't have the, you're only just trying to get it to work. 
Um, anyway, so there's two. So I really, really recommend this green foam, by the way, because otherwise you end up with leaves and birds and everything can snow in your horn. So you've got to put a cover on your horn. Um, and a horn is super game compared to a dish, right? So it's just it's much higher efficiency. It's like it's 90, I mean, it's like 85 at least percent efficient compared to a dish is probably like 35, 40 percent efficient as far as the signal coming in. So a much smaller horn gets you a lot more than a, than a dish. Of. I mean, you can build a much bigger dish, but it's, it's hard, you can't really go beyond. Um, if you want a couple tips on your horn, don't use wire, use hobby brass too. It'll give you a better match. What, oh, and that, no, well, that's a silver wire there. But it is, I'm telling you. Now, well, actually, so we, I actually do know about this, because I've, I've used all kinds of feed probes, and by far the best is that very, very, very narrow feed probe. That is contrary to accepted practice. Well, I'm telling you, that's, that's, yeah. that's, if you ask Steve White what numerical code he used, we, we tried that, we, we actually worked extremely hard, I it's swear that's the best. It. It doesn't just, matter how elegant your theory is or how smart you are if it disagrees with the experiment. Well, no, but I'm telling you, this, this is by far the best system temperature. <laughs> <any system. laughs> that's a, well, I do waveguide transitions for a living, and that's what that is, actually. It's not so much a resonant cavity, it's a circular waveguide transition. And at the back wall of it, what you want to do is, I noticed the gaps you have there, your conductivity is poor. You want to take that same copper yeah. tape and you want to go along the whole well, back of it. I would except for the fact that I don't want to fill up with water. So it's, it's tricky that, you know. It's, and drill a small hole in it. Well, like, like, I, like, I, that's right. I agree, I agree that you can do a better job than I can do. That's why I'm here to tell you you can do a better job than I can do. But uh, so I'm completely happy to see a better one being made. I, and, uh, yeah, so that's. Well, well, no, I think, yeah, I think it is, but I want them to be able to get away from and just build it on their own, right? So that can do this with the drill. Even a, even a three pound Maxwell House coffee can will do better than this. Well, okay, good. I, I'm, I'm, I can, you don't have to make it. No. <laughs> 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 but you could have you 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 taken over my uh, presentation. Um, so we try to, so people know about, who knows about GNU radio? How much time have I got left? So, so, well, so who's built a design using GNU? So there's like several of you. Okay, so we have, and this is almost impossible to write down, so I didn't, when did you make this? We actually, so this is so funny, I've been in my cohort just last summer. And um, basically we made an introduction to how to use GNU Radio if you haven't done it. And it's only five minutes long, it shows you, and it actually works completely with audio, so it's extremely easy to do. I would, I would not even look at, it. it's off of the open source Radio Telescope's website, so that would be where I would go to get it. I wouldn't bother typing, because you're never going to get that many characters right, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, it is there, and I think it's a good, it's sort of a nice way of, maybe that's, I don't know if this is what the right, yeah, uh, Sarah wants to do, but it's actually quite easy to do videos with a Mac anyway. Because, so we were sitting here talking, and all the stuff, the screens moved around, and, and it's like five minutes long. Um, so, Finally, I'm going to get to the science part of what we can do with this horn. And, and I know you can do it, we'll show you outside uh, later on, maybe at lunchtime. Um, so you know that the galaxy, I have a couple little things about that. I cannot do Andromeda, I've tried and tried and tried, I cannot see Andromeda with this horn. I, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just using this as an example. But it turns out, of course, one little thing, so this, this dark line here tells you a lot more than I appreciated. This means that this is the close side of the galaxy because the close side obscures the center of the galaxy. But anyway, but it also it sort of tells you which way that the thing is spinning. So if, if we were in Andromeda at the same distance from the galactic center, we would be here. And now it turns out that this is the H1. This is from Bond and uh, actually uh, other, but it turns out most of the galactic hydrogen is outside of where we are. There is galactic hydrogen at the center, but it's not the dominant uh, it's not like it's all concentrated in the center of the galaxy, it's not on the edge. Um, but you, and you, anyway, it extends much, much further out. Now with this, this is um, a light work memo 18, so we have to write, a, if you do an experiment, you have to write a memo or something. It would be better to put it in a paper, but a memo is a much lower barrier. You say, well, this is what I did. And uh, so memo 18, so I have, this is uh, nine beautiful minutes of uh, data. 
here, right? And so at that point, I can actually aim at the Perseus arm and then just tilt my little protractor down to different degrees, and I would make the observations. And you can sort of vaguely see here, it's a little bit too tight, but that the signal decreases as you go. Now it turns out the Earth, its North Pole, of course, has the North Pole where we spin around, but it points off at some kind of a funny low galactic latitude, 22 degrees. So when you move your, in elevation, you move out of the, if, depending on where we are in our rotation of the Earth, you move in or out of the galactic plane, right? And um, so it turns out that at this time, so what I would do is take 30 seconds of data. So each one of this is 30 seconds, each one of those lines. But you see how, you know, the signal to noise is just fantastic in 30 seconds. You can actually very easily map the galaxy in 30 seconds with this. And so you see that the, when you're looking at the lowest galactic latitude, so this is the likely longitude, so it's out, it's not towards the galactic center, this would be zero to longitude, this is 90, 180, so we're looking out of the center of the galaxy. Um, the azimuth and the elevation, so we start out at azimuth pointing south, 90 degrees, straight up, down to 10 degrees elevation, it still works at 10 degrees. Um, this has a baseline subtracted, by the way, the system temperature goes way up when you're looking at those, because you're looking mostly at the ground. Um, but anyway, you can see, you see the, it turns out we're looking at the Perseus arm the whole time here, so it's a little bit less interesting as far as what you get, but that's just a few 30 seconds of data, right? And you just record it, you stop, you move, you run outside, you plug in your, you move the telescope, you run back inside, you turn it back on again. But you can do the whole sky. You can actually, if you had a crack team, you could do the whole sky in a night, but nobody has that kind of attention span. They, uh, they, uh, because you can move move the telescope all over the place and you forget where you are. About two two hours is the maximum I've ever seen anybody observe at one time at the, the horn, but then that's uh, not what, how it works. Um, so this is the predecessor um, up observed. Now this actually is the newest observer interface. So this is with an Air Spy Mini, which is a certain one of those SDR dongles. This, this is the code that I've written. This is what you would get if you were to download that and you already had GNU Radio installed. It won't do anything without GNU Radio. My code is only a megabyte and a half, so there's maybe you know, a microsecond to download. But, so what it, it does is it allows you to either record, you're mostly waiting when you're fiddling around, and if, you're, if you have the telescope, you need to calibrate the telescope. How do you calibrate? And I have no, no moving parts inside this thing. There's no on-off switches or anything like that. So I just pick it up and I put it, point it down at the ground, and because it's a horn, that works perfectly. A dish, it's a pain in the butt to do that. You really don't, it doesn't work. You want to use a horn. Anyway, um, but this is the, the hot load signal here, so it's painted red. And uh, then this was um, the cold load, because you try to pick a spot that happens to be fairly far from the collective plane. And this was some random other spot, which is the reference spot. So you can record these things as you go. And then, and so what, anyway, else? So this is when you actually do the look at the galaxy and you look at different places. So this is the signals. Um, this was many, many, well, this happened to be a couple years ago almost now, a year and a half ago, um, different spots on the uh, different latitude and longitudes, and you see different structures. Now, you, you do need a vivid imagination to turn these curves into arms of our galaxy, right? They don't look like arms of our galaxy, right? You'd have to, you have to be able to convince your student that those are arms of your galaxy, right? And so that's a little bit of a challenge. It's sort of a, a bit of a the presentation you have to work with. And when you look at the North Galactic Pole or South Galactic Pole, you still see, um, uh, this is the South Galactic Pole, you still see signal, so there's signal everywhere in the sky, but it's, um, this, these are actually longer averages. These are probably like five minute averages. I'll show you why that we do that. So you, you to get the five minute averages, you have a tremendous signal to noise, and you can see the signal. There's no place where you don't see the galaxy if you average for five minutes. Um, so this is what can you this is the thing that you would download if you followed that. You have some is you put your little name in it, and then you have some block that says where to get your data from, and then you say turn it into a vector, which this does. And then it turns it into a magnitude, and then it then it does something special for radio astronomy, which is a median filtering. 
to get rid of short-term interference. So this, these blocks take four spectra as they come in. So this is, these data are coming in fast and furious here, but it takes four spectra in and gives one out, which has been RFI rejected. Does it again, does it again. So you Software get- Software integration, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you get down to about like a second. By this point, my data rate is one second, so then I can eat that data on a very weak computer. Um, I use this Spoodroid thing. So, so again, um, what happens then is you don't have, you're, you're all busy. This is your hobby, right? So you can't be out there all day. So what you do is this is a right ascension plot, and this is a declination plot. And so what you do is you go out and you set your telescope up, and you go into the house and have a cocktail, go to bed, and uh, whatever you do. Um, but then um, you come back the next day and you've got 24 hours of data, and you just keep doing it as the, and after a month goes by. So I would imagine my goal would be that the high schools would, they wouldn't do a lot, they would just set it up and then they would do whatever else they're teaching and then they would slowly accumulate. So, you know, and you have to remember, it's a little bit of bookkeeping to remember where you are. And in some peculiarities, I'm not quite sure why this doesn't seem to match as well as it does, but I think it's because we're, the, the outer galaxy is very bright in galactic hydrogen. This is the outer galaxy up here. This is, this is right ascension declinations. This is the horizon for me and the North Pole's up here. But you, and I wrote this software. Um, so this is what, if you then court, transform these coordinates into galactic the longitude. So, the uh, black like center is here, <coughs> and seems like there's been a, so the North Pole moves over here. Um, this is below the horizon, which is difficult. You can't do anything about that, except you have to get soil at this. Last week's conference, I met somebody from South Africa, who, and she wants to build one of these. So hopefully, we'll get that filled in the next time around. So that'll be good. But, um, the, uh, but anyway, so she'll have to do that. But that's what you can do with this system. Um, so, so, I'm actually, because I had a little bit more time than I, um, uh, I actually did this in 20 minutes at a conference last week or two weeks ago. Um, so I'm going to tell you this, part. so what is our, what is our approach for progress at the National Science Foundation? So we are out there looking for groups who want to put proposals together. Now, I don't think that you guys are ideal for that, except I think you would be a very strong partner in a unit, like the people who are already from the universities, you are very strong partners. So you can actually look, I mean, this us, the NSF requires a outreach plan, like you want to reach underserved, unfortunately, very few of you are underserved here, but anyway, so, uh, so, um, so we need to, uh, what you'd like, underserved groups, Actually, like some people even uh, do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, go to prisons and teach, and that's part of their research project. Well, well, for Appalachia, we're okay. Yeah, we're well, well, if, if you, if, I think you can make that sale, but you have to do it, and you have to find somebody to team with, because you really don't have the. You need to find the teachers, or you need to find. You have the expertise, but you don't have the way of getting to the community. You need to get to the community for you to be a big, a big, a strong partner, right? You could do elder hostels or something. I mean, that's the one thing that they also do. Um, yeah. Were you planning to do a demonstration? I am, yes. Oh, oh the HDMI cable? Okay, thank you very good. So, with, I just want to shut it up. We'll set it up and show you. I, well, I have to say what I, I'm going to finish my talk, but I'll tell you what before. Um, what I'd like to do the best with the school group is give them the, like, usually, again, somebody will take charge and they'll look at the, and then you hand off the telescope, it's light, so you can move, and you can use it like a gun to sort of look at the different, and then you'll see after, you can tell them to find the galactic plane. So the, the sky is a bright, as you know, a very bright radio stripe. And so then they'll be looking around, see the right, so they'll see the ground, and so oh, let's look at somebody, see the temperature go up. And then every so often they go, oh, I see it. And then, then, and then you can get them to find the galactic plane with this horn as sort of, in a freestanding thing, because you can figure out where it is by the signal going up and down. You can sort of, you'll see that. If you, but anyway, that's my little trick I like to do. It. It's sort of light enough to see that. Um, so, but again, so back to what, what do I, what, why did I come here? Because I was looking for you to build teams of some, maybe a different telescope. I mean, Elliot's got a 
the telescope she's pushing, which is a, is a, a loop antenna. And whatever, maybe an alternative is more sensitive or less sensitive, or does, or maybe as a ground tracking station for space, uh, um, maybe you can imagine. I kind of would like to have, I would, in order to have a square kilometer array, right, a square kilometer surface area, it turns out there's, there's um, 30,000 high schools in the country, right? So they need, we need about eight, seven meters of dish in each site to have the whole square kilometer. But you can do it, the GBT can be done in a fraction of that one. Uh, anyway, so they only need a few dishes to get up the GBT sensitivity. But, but we need, it needs to be a big plan that we would like you to do. I mean, that's sort of it. We're the National Science Foundation, not like the rural Science Foundation. Um, and so anyway, that's what I'm sort of urging you to do is to find a way of finding groups to work with that will do these big projects that will actually advance science. So, and I have some ideas myself that I would like to put forward. Probably like cosmic rays is one particular area where you can use little telescopes to get the cosmic ray flashes because that already knows, is known to work. And probably with this kind of telescope you might be able to use it. But, but anyway, so what, this is, this is sort of a step backwards about the NSF process is where I'm going to go. I'm sort of adding in the NSF process to this. So we, we, the NSF does want active citizen science. It turns out the NSF does not want to fund citizen science, though. They want to fund research in citizen science. So if you say to the NSF, that's not, I'm an astronomer. You go to the education department and say, we want to do citizen science. They say, that is great. Go to the Department of Education. Because it's not, it has, NSF does research. So you would have to sell them something where you're doing something, some new aspect of education that you want to study. That's what you, so people never get that. Because it turn, it's not doing citizen science. That's already known to be successful. So the NSF is not interested in funding that. It's only research in education that is fundable at the NSF. So you have to find out some, some new way. And you could, I think you could sell, if you're that putting together a whole nationwide network to do research is some community thing, that might be sellable at the NSF. But only if it's a new and it's sort of a new aspect. It's not just it's doing the same thing over again. Um, so anyway, so we, we, we need to get, you know, I think you guys have great capabilities. We probably need a science leader to do those kind of things, that would be the science person who would actually guide the science side of your research project, you know, because you're the outreach side of the project. I, would, I think that would be the only way it would be likely to be successful. So there's a science side, and then you guys are the outreach side. That would work. Um, so how do you write a proposal? Well, you find somebody who's already done it, usually, because they might like to write a proposal. You find out what's already been done. You say well, how you can build on what has been done. And you know what you have to, they, probably the key thing that you have to say the very first is why is this work important? And you have to write the proposal in a way that you are excited and you have to, because the key thing is you're presenting these amongst a bunch of proposals that are, everybody else has already written great ideas. So unless you can be excited about the project that you want to do and communicate that in your proposal, you're not going to win. You're, not gonna, you're never going to get to the top. You have to be excited. It has to be the biggest thing that's ever happened. You know, it's got it's to be a, a kind of a selling and why are you the right team to do the work? How are you going to do the work? And why are you the, do you have the right team? And I think probably you, you have to like build that team. That's what, that's what you do. Um, so the uh, NSF. So what does the NSF do if we don't do research? Uh, some people ask me that. Um, and so what we do is we solicit, we write solicitations for proposals. And so what you, do, what you do is that the NSF has this idea that we want to do certain kinds of things and then we wait for proposals to come in. But we write, we give some outlines, it's a thing called a solicitation. And you write a proposal that's responsive to that solicitation. I'm going to tell you about two of them and then you're either recommended for funding or declined. So um, get a great idea, right, this is sort of a repeat of what I just said about you get a great idea. Make sure you have it, and you have to have an assessment plan too. I don't know if you're aware of all these things. There's gadgets. If you don't know about that, and you're writing a proposal, you're sort of done for. You have to know that all these things, you, you've got to have a plan to judge. It's sort of like you're talking with Project Joe. I mean, that's really relevant. And how do you have it? You want to 
I think the Project Joe is a great idea, but you really do have to follow up on it, you know, to get more money, because obviously they're going to want to see, you know, how is it working. And you, have to have, you have to write that into the proposal. And that, I thought your suggestions about deposits are a good idea, actually. I thought that was a reasonable approach. Um, so there are many, many different types of proposals. Uh, the, the, where I think that this would be fit the most in is in a, a thing called a raise proposal, which is a kind of a, it's called interdisciplinary, which is also a fashion word at the NSF. Like it's sort of, instead of just being radio astronomy, it's also education, and it's engineering, and that, those kind of things, what you, you then want to do is you have to, it turns out you, you write a proposal that has that, and you just need two program officers to say it's a good idea. The sort of a quality. So I would be willing to, to write a letter saying it's a good idea to do any kind of radio astronomy citizen science, but then you would still need to get somebody else who's not me and not vested to get the idea to be able to then write a full proposal. Yeah? Uh, question. So, you know, we've, we've written the ILI grants and we've won this stuff, we've won NSF grants before, we've been through all this yeah. process. But you began with the talk about low cost radio astronomy stuff. Yeah. Okay, and you're talking about a five hundred dollar thing. Nobody's gonna write a grant for a five hundred dollar yes. thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to We wouldn't even get that five hundred dollars. Two concepts here. Uh -huh. So are you advocating that someone should take this on and write a grant to produce a thousand of these things so that yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm grant? saying I'm not really even saying I'm just saying I'm a hobbyist who built a radio telescope. But my job is not that. It is to get citizen science done to help encourage the community to do citizen science by applying for grants at the NSF to do it. And so, and because the, if you're advocating that sort of approach, in that someone would take on this project or some group that they would build a large number of these, then uh, to provide them to students, then things like an integrated RF package that could be designed mm -hmm. and, yeah. and made cheaper yeah. would then be, could be possible. Yeah. That. And that might be one of the aspects that separates it from buying pieces for mini circuits and putting them together. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. The, 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 so to the, follow the, up uh, with his question, just so that I'm clear, you would, the intercept would look more favorably if one person was going to say, "Hey, I'm going around the country and put these in 500 different places." That would be something that. Would well, that that's the kind of thing I could imagine being successful. Okay. I it's the you are always being competed. They would try to find some. Well, some no, there's a lot of competition. That's competition. You understand that? Yeah. Yeah, we're trying to put you in a corner. Just trying to figure out what you're suggesting. But, but the idea is that you might have lost. Okay. Well, yeah. That's right. so I, I'm sort of done. I'm really in the question phase. Anyway, there's just let me just tell you that you can't just send a proposal. Well, you can, but it usually doesn't work if you just send a proposal. Yeah, it has to. Trash. It has to have. So raise is one. You'd have to go look. It's a huge document. You read all the fine print. And you would then submit the proposal. Goalie is this academic liaisons with industry. That's another one that might work for you. Those are the places that I thought would be the most likely for Sarah to have an in at the NSF. That's that's you know, that's legit. Um, so and this grant opportunity. So that because I think that this does have the radio astronomy really does have a lot of industrial applications. You know, and a huge economic well, impact. Remote sensing in general. So, big money. Anyway, I'm just going to skip all that so you can't read it anyway. Um, so, you, who do you talk to? You talk to me. So, you have to, like, you have to, like, make, you have an idea, you need to build a team, I can help with the idea stuff. And sort of maybe the team you're going to have to find yourself, but I can maybe make some suggestions. If you do. Um, and you can't even submit the proposal. You have to find your research. Somebody, I think somebody at Sarah could actually be the sponsored research office person. You'd have to figure out what the rules for that are. Every university has that. But it's so probably be easier to do it through some university. You probably like to like Dan Reichert or you guys. Could you go down to the community college level, for example? Any, anybody can submit a No, but I mean to, to be favorably accepted. So an individual would have the toughest time, a university would have the best time. Uh -huh. Would a community college be acceptable? It, so we get small, there is sort of a little bit of a research for undergraduates. Uh, it's not a set-aside, which is a big thing. Set-aside means it really is money, but it's sort of a target. So that the targets can either be met or not met. But it, it's, sort of, it, it's, it's certainly doable when you could do that, apply at any, any level. I mean, there are, the USRA and different organizations are just to put the environment together. And yes, you have a question? Oh, well, I mean, I have a recommendation. So I'm a grad student in astrophysics, just, you know, doing observing on the fire. But I did what you got to do for a job. 
<laughs> uh, well, um, I, in, in undergrad, I worked with NASA Space Grant, um, which also does a lot of outreach, a lot of other different stuff like that. And um, each state theoretically should have a space grant office, yes. and they could be the um, it's science different, aficionado. It's a different thing, though. Space grants is a whole. Well, it's a whole, it's a whole different thing, but they could be the science aficionado. They could partner with Sarah, and they could provide the. the there's yeah. probably some areas of land and stuff, grants and floor, yeah. and they can help you guys out with this. I mean, it, um, it's just finding the. Uh, so that's a certain thing for this and stuff. Right. So it could be that that would work. I mean, that's, that's how it could work. I'm just thinking about how people could, you know, because getting into a university and getting them interested in doing something is typically difficult, but at the smaller scale school, uh -huh. you would find more. And I found space grants, for example, really tough. They usually have all that money earmarked, so they don't want anything. If they're not yeah. Well, if they're it's all there's an in group who has that. That's right. Um, yes? Just a quick question. So you're talking about a national for, uh, project level. Could you like, explain to me what that well, anything like that would be, I think, would be great. You could imagine a lot of times they may not, the NSF wouldn't go for the whole nine yards of, you know, uh, you know $10 million to build. They might go for sort of a, a, a sort of prototype grant kind of thing. So like that well, yeah. West Virginia is so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that could, that could work. You could actually even go. A lot of times you can apply for a a like a, a meeting grant, a science based meeting grant, and those can be fairly big, like fifty thousand dollars. And those don't require a panel review. So you can then if you had something like and you could but you put it together a credible, like a smaller university. Like I don't know if you, I've, I've not heard of uh, University of Rich, uh, Richmond, Virginia. No, probably a big place, but I wasn't aware of them. They did a conference and. Uh, but I would probably you'd be best off. You couldn't do it as yourself. You'd have to find the university who would want it, like Marshall could sponsor. That. That's. I, I'm out of time. I got, I got one more minute. Left. Oh, oh. Any more questions? One more question. Because we're trying to keep on scheduling. So I do. So actually, I tell you. So I've got a sort of. I built a wood base kit. I know that nobody wants to build a wooden base kit, but I built one of those just to put together. And I've got, a, I was going to, if anyone anybody wanted to build uh, their own horn radio telescope uh, this evening, we could try that. Um, <laughs> and um, and, and uh, I've got the, the pieces of parts. You know, yes. uh, and we'll do a little demo at lunchtime here just to show you what we can do. I just wanted to, uh, for Dr. Langston, I want to. First, apologize. I realized I put the 12th instead of the 11th. So, for those chronicolo chronicologically not challenged, which I am, <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you. To those who just oh, boy. Thank you. <laughs>